Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conversations about Ella Montgomery. My name is Benjamin Lefebvre, and I'm director of Ella Montgomery Online. And on behalf of the steering committee of Conversations about Ella Montgomery, I want to welcome all of you today, either watching us live over Zoom or watching us later on YouTube. It is with great pleasure that I um, uh, mention that this episode or this installment of Conversations about Ella Montgomery focuses on the uh, three of the Ontario sites that were meaningful to Montgomery's writing and, and, and life, but also have been meaningful to her legacy thanks to the incredibly hard work of so many dedicated people who have worked so hard to, um, to preserve these, these places and to basically spread the news about Montgomery's work uh, in their local communities and for the benefit of Montgomery's reading community all over the world. So for those of you who um, are new to Montgomery's life, it's probably worth mentioning that although she was born and grew up in Prince Edward Island, after she married a minister in her mid thirties, she moved to uh, Ontario because of his career as a minister and ended up living in three different, three different areas in Ontario. So Leeskdale, which is outside Uxbridge between 1911 and 1926, Norville, which is outside Toronto, which is between 1926 and 1935, and finally in Toronto at a house called Journey's End that she lived in between 1935 and 1942. In addition to those places that she lived, there was also one place that she vacationed in 1922 and that became meaningful to her imagination as well as to uh, a nice family memory for, for her. And that was the uh, settlement of Bala. And this place is meaningful because it ended up being the, um, the setting of the only one of her novels that's set entirely in Ontario, which is The Blue Castle. So today we have representatives from three of those locations, Leesdale, Bala, and Norville. And so I will turn it over to our moderator today with Sarah Goff. Sarah Goff is, is from upstate New York. She's been involved in the Montgomery com community since 1995 and attended her first Ella Montgomery Institute conference in 2000. And she has been since back to PEI six times, including presenting at two of those conferences. And her favorite Montgomery heroine is Jane of Lantern Hill. So um, before I give, before I pass this over to you, uh, Sarah, just to remind everyone that there are multiple ways to participate today. Um, Sarah will, will uh, moderate the conversation, but if you want to ask a question to any of the presenters, you can type in your question through the chat box that you see. You, you, there's an icon marked chat at the bottom of your screen. So if you click on that, it will open a window and you can type in a question. And I'll be, I'll, I will read those out. Or at certain points, we, you, can, you are welcome to uh, turn on your microphone and ask the question out loud. Uh, if you would like to have your cameras on or off, that's entirely up to you. Um, if you wanna just sit and listen or ask questions, either way is entirely up to you, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to you, Sarah. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. Um, I'm going to give a few brief notes about each of them, and then we're going to get into the conversation itself. So our first panelist is Kathy Wazelenski. See, look, I asked how to say it, and I still screwed it up. I'm so sorry. No <laughs> uh, after Kathy retired from her 32-year teaching career, she became ward counselor in Uxbridge Township, where her responsibilities as tourism director included Leesdale Mance, where Montgomery lived from 1911 to 1926. She spearheaded Parks Canada's historical evaluation reports in preparation of interior and exterior restoration and raised funds for its restoration. A former president of the Lucy Maud Montgomery Society of Ontario, an organization whose projects included purchasing the Leesdale Church when it came up for sale and turning it into a visitor center for special events, Kathy continues to be involved on the LMMSO committee, which offers tours and special events to educate people around the world about Montgomery's legacy as one of Canada's best authors. So thank you for being with us today, Kathy. 
Um, it's a pleasure. Next, thank you. Um, it's wonderful. Um, next, I'd like to also introduce Linda Jackson Hutton and Jack Hutton. Um, Linda Jackson Hutton's first experience with Ellen Montgomery's writing was when her grade six teacher read Anne of Green Gables aloud in class. <clears throat> Linda later received a degree in sociology from the University of Waterloo, a diploma in home economics, and a certificate from Toronto Teachers College. This experience, coupled with her honeymoon with Jack and PEI, led her to become co-owner, curator, and restorer <clears throat> of the tourist home that has become Bala's Museum. Jack Hutton worked as a writer and as a musician. He was a reporter in three provinces, wrote a nationally syndicated column for 40 daily newspapers in the 1960s, and has played ragtime piano everywhere from Mississippi Riverboats to Roy Thompson Hall. Jack's mm -hmm. life changed when Linda started to read Anne of Green Gables to him on their PEI honeymoon in 1990. He has spent the last three decades running a Montgomery Museum in Bala with Linda and singing the praises of Ellen Montgomery and her writing, loving every minute of it. So welcome to Linda and Jack. Thank you. Thank you. And our last panelist, Kathy Gassel, was born in Norville in 1952, 10 years after Ellen Montgomery died in Toronto and grew up surrounded by Montgomery's relatives, friends, and former neighbors, including Kathy's beloved godmother, Joy Laird. She credits Montgomery for her 12-year career as an elected official and credits her community for shaping her lasting impression of Montgomery as Norville's most famous former citizen. She has been involved in she has been involved for many years in a major community project dedicated to the preservation of the Presbyterian manse, Montgomery's former home in Norval. Welcome to Kathy. So to get started, we, what we would like to do is talk a little bit about each location. Um, we'd like to start with Leesdale, which I will try to not keep tripping over saying. Um, and Kathy, can you start by telling us a little bit more about um, Montgomery's time there? Sure. Um, Montgomery came in 1911 as the bride of Ewan MacDonald, and uh, they had been married that summer. They came in the fall and had honeymooned in the British Isles. Um, Ewan had been there a year when uh, Montgomery joined him. Um, he was well loved in the um, church uh, and um, so she was coming to a very small hamlet that um, she uh, was unfamiliar with. However, um, she did finally settle in and um, she had three children there. She had um, Chester first and then baby Hugh, who unfortunately passed at birth and is buried just down the road from Leesdale at the Foster Cemetery, and she had Stuart. Uh, the two boys uh, went to a one-room school just down the street or the road from the manse, and Montgomery took part in so many of the community activities, working with the youth, um, doing Christmas concerts through the church, and so on, so heavily, heavily involved. Um, Red Cross during the war years and so on. Uh, so she had a very active role as a minister's wife, as a mother, and as a community member of various organizations, um, including the longest standing book club, I think in Canada called the Hypatia Club. And uh, so very, very active, very much loved. And Ewan had two um, posts at that time. He had Leesdale and he had Zephyr, which was another small town north of there. So um, she would travel up to Zephyr oftentimes to play the organ at that church and um, just took part as much as she could in uh, community activities. As well, she wrote 11 of her 22 novels there. And um, she seemed, seemed to find uh, time to do that. She would often lock herself in the parlor for a few hours and um, leave the children with um, the housekeeper 
And if they really, really needed her, um, they would knock quietly on the door or send a little letter to her under the door and she would attend to their needs. But for the most part, um, she managed to get some quality writing in and um, she seemed to love her life in Leesdale. I don't know what else to say um, about the site. I hope that answers some of your questions. It consisted of course of the, the house. It's an ordinary home, but it's now a national site. And the church um, where Ewan was minister, which became a provincial site in itself. So uh, we have the two buildings to manage. And um, our committee is a mighty little committee that has worked um, nonstop, I have to say, um, to bring that site to the state it is in now. So the home is um, restored inside and out. The um, church is restored and is used as a visitor center and um, we also just acquired more land from a local farmer, and so there will be good things coming on those. We acquired two pieces of land. One is forest, and there'll be great things coming there, and the other we'll probably use for parking because we end up parking all over the village when we have bigger events. So lots more to come and we'll continue working there. Thank you so much. I love that story about picturing the kids like sending little notes underneath the door. Um, mm -hmm. I did get the chance to visit um, both places, the manse and the church. Um, and I also love the story about how um, she would be able to write at her desk and see the kids walking home from school out the window. Um, it really is a wonderful museum to be able to visit and so it's great work that you're doing. So, so thank you. It, it does look like there's some questions um, for you in the chat that we'll, we can loop back to, I think, at, after we get to the, the other two sites. Um, so Linda and Jack, I would like to, to turn to you and um, tell us about, about your site and its importance to Montgomery and the work that you've been doing there. I have to say this, this is a really good challenge for a good marriage for the two of us to be on Zoom together. <laughs> but um, for Lucy Ma Montgomery, for Maud coming to Bala, it was a time that she had been very, very distressed. She couldn't dream, she couldn't write. She was suffering ment mental, sort of a small mental breakdown as was Ewan. So, for coming to Bala, to Muskoka, all yeah. that left her. And she could dream again. And when you can dream again, you can write. And the Blue Castle came out of that holiday. So I, I'm going to let the guy beside me talk, too. I don't know what I can add to that. <clears throat> I'm going to say something a bit later. And this may interest uh, Beth and some of the others about the man who I think was most responsible for the Blue Castle. And Mary Beth, you're thinking who that is, <laughs> Yuka. And I am going to say John Mustard. And I'll have more to say about that. Except it has been quite an adventure with this lady to my left. When we got married on the Seguin Ben, the minister did his ceremony and he said to me, I know you, and I said, I do. I had no idea <laughs> what that meant, <laughs> including today. So <laughs> this, is, this is the man who'd never read Lucy Maud Montgomery or anything. And the, and the poor man's got dragged along all these years and done very well, I have to say. So. Certainly. I have to say Muskoka is just so vivid in the Blue Castle. Do you feel like it, it um, is captured as well as it is to experience it in real life? Like, 
I had I haven't been able to go there yet, and so I'm I'm curious. Like it's it seems so vivid to me. I can almost Sarah, imagine the first, what it's the like. The first time I read <laughs> the Blue Castle, I was so in love with this book and her word painting and the scenery. I thought I want to move there, and they said, "Well, wait a minute. I already live here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful. Um, okay, uh, Kathy Gassel, would you like to tell us a little bit about Norval? Okay, thank you. Well, Norval was a very um, small self-contained village in 1926, and Maud was in her late 40s. Her son Chester was a student at uh, St. Andrew's Private School in Toronto, and Stuart would follow after he finished his schooling at Norval Public School. Uh, the Reverend Ewan MacDonald, of course, had Norval um, Presbyterian Church and Union Church, which was about five miles away from the village. So in Norval, ministers and their wives were very important. Um, and Maud wasted no time in cementing her bonds with Norval residents. She brought such an influx of energy uh, with her wonderful sense of music. She was a Sunday school teacher, and she also was in charge of the church youth group. And of course, she hosted many fundraisers on the front, front lawn of the, the manse. I recently asked John McClure, who was a, a former um, member of Maud's youth, uh, church youth group, uh, about uh, the telephone in the kitchen. And he responded, oh no, the telephone was on the wall in the dining room. The kitchen was far too busy. Maud excelled at time management, as we all know, with juggling a writing career, church duties, and also volunteering in our community. And the Norval mm -hmm. Presbyterian Church provided Maud with nature right on her doorstep. She could see the Credit, credit River from the kitchen window, upstairs windows, and the Hill of Pines from her writing room in the um, in the master bedroom. And uh, Norval also provided her with um, many, many favorite places that she could walk. Um, the Credit River, streams, country roads, and um, the 500 nature reserve, 500 acre nature reserve that's owned by Upper Canada College. And we all know that nature um, restore, was restorative to Maud. So she wrote three and a half um, volumes of her Norval journals, writing descriptions of the extraordinary beauty of the village. She called the Credit River the most exquisite river. Enchanting bits of beauty are visible in the distance, lovely hills everywhere and beautiful trees around the church. Norval is one of the beauty spots of Ontario, she wrote. She was also an amateur photographer, um, leaving a historic snapshot of the life and times of the turn of the century of our turn of the century village, which reminded her of a Scottish Glen. Her Norval records are invaluable to us as we move forward to open uh, the Lucy Ma Montgomery Museum and Literary Center in her honor and create a tourist destination. So Maud um, spelled out in her wills that in her will that the Norval journals should not be published until 50 years after her death. Of course, Maud imagined many things in her life, but she never imagined that Norval residents would still be alive in 1992, or perhaps she did. Um, there were many unhappy people who, who read about themselves and their neighbors. Um, Maud also had a, um, a handwritten cookbook um, that inspired her Norval relatives, uh, Elaine uh, Laird Webb and her daughter Kelly to publish Aunt Maud's cookbook in 1996. And this book has been translated into Japanese, Polish, and Swedish, and it still remains in print. And there is a quote in the front of the, um, of the book cover, and I know many of you have heard it many times, but she said, if, if I had not been such a poor devil of an author, I think I would have made an excellent cook. And um, so I'll just tell you a bit about some of the books that she published in Norval. So of course she was inspired by her surroundings and everyday life in Norval. And of course she uh, was beginning to create new characters. 
So Emily's Quest was published in 1927, uh, which is part of the Emily trilogy, um, of, including Emily of New Moon and Emily Climes. And there is a comment in this book um, where she says a church becomes a barn. Well, actual, in actual fact, this did happen in Norville. The original clapboard Presbyterian church became a horse barn on one of our local farm property. And then Magic of Marigold was published in 1929. And also in here, she includes um, an experience that happened to her son, Chester, with lard and sulfur, but she tells it through uh, Gwen in the book. Um, a Tangled Web, 1933, and Maud photographs herself with the Wollner jug standing in so outside of the man's. And of course, the jug is now restored and is part of the University of Guelph L.M. Montgomery collection. Pat of Silver Bush in 1933. And in here, Maud also embeds a story about an autograph quilt, one of which um, she participated in with Union Presbyterian Church ladies, and she embroidered her own name on the quilt. And it remains a very, um, proud possession of that church. And it was a very popular fundraiser at that time. Uh, Courageous Woman in 1920 and 1933, which she co-authored. And it's a collection of essays about Canadian women. Um, and 1935, Mistress Pat, which is dedicated to Ernest and Myrtle Webb of Prince Edward Island. And of course, many of you know that Maud was instrumental in bringing two of their children to Norval. Marion and Keith. Marion met, married a local Norval boy, Murray Laird, and Keith lived here for 47 years. Mm -hmm. And Anita Webb lived in the area, traveling and visiting often to Norval. And she also helped um, Ewan and Maude when they moved to, to Toronto. I'm probably at my limit. I was going <laughs> to give a quick quote, but I won't. Thank you. I think you should, you can go for it if you'd like to. Okay, all right. <laughs> so it's, it's Maud's quote from November 5th, 1935. Thoughts of leaving Norville, my hills, my trees, my gardens, the beautiful church I've lived and worked for and the beautiful roads all around. I hate the thought of leaving Norville. I have never loved any place save Cavendish, unquote. Beautiful. And this time of year, very close, no November 5th. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, so we have time for additional questions. I think um, I wanna go back to um, Linda and Jack because I think I need to know about John Mustard. <laughs> and I think you have more to share with us um, about, about your um, experiences. And you have some photos to share with us as well. Is thank that you. correct? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to go first? Sure. Okay, ladies first, he says. So uh, Ben, if you wouldn't mind putting up a, a, a picture of our museum when it was very, very uh, new, just bought from us, before us. And I call it, whoops, that's, there it is. I call this the dis disappointed house. And this is the house that I fell in love with before we realized it had anything to do with Lucy Maud Montgomery. And we'd only been married slightly more than two weeks. We were home from our Prince Edward Island honeymoon and saw this house. And I said to Jack, look, it's got gables. It's just like a Prince Edward Island house. And I said, wouldn't it make a wonderful museum? And maybe Ben would show us the new picture as well. With a year of work, this, um, is basically what the museum looks like now. And thanks to our librarian in Bala, who read us a letter that she'd received from Mary Rubio asking where Maud stayed in Bala in 1922. And thanks to our research, finding out that this house was owned by a woman named Fanny Pike, who ran it as a tourist home. And our phone call to Mary Rubio, who read us the handwritten diaries that were not published yet saying that Maud and Ewan and the boys had come to Bala 
and that they were staying at Roseland Lodge, but got their meals up the street at a certain Mrs. Pike's. We were able to buy this house, save it from demolition, and we're coming up to our 30th anniversary on July 24th of 2022. So there's the after picture. Um, ben, can I see another picture, please? Sure, which one? Yeah, the one of um, me sawing, helping saw wood, that'd be good, yes. So here we are, there's were so many restorations to be made. The house, first of all, needed a new beam down the middle so that um, the house wouldn't collapse into the center. And later when we put a 498 pound 1925 Frigid Frigidaire fridge in there, we were very glad that beam was there. And there's the fridge. <laughs> so, and the sink to the left of it, I found in Gravenhurst at a house that was being torn down and it was the original stagecoach stop for Gravenhurst, just outside of Bala, about 20 minutes away. And what else have we got there, Ben? Okay. So could we go to the photograph beneath that first? So the house might have been had some charming aspects on the outside, but the inside was not charming. This is the kitchen, the first room I started in. And I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a background in home economics. And I did a lot of studying to try and decide what an electrified kitchen in the 1920s might look like. Bala had electricity from its uh, little waterfalls from 1914 on. So if you bought shares in the Bala Power and Light Company, you could have electricity. So which was quite rare actually for um, rural areas. So now we'll go from that picture to the one that Ben showed a moment ago. So back up. So there's what that space looks like now. This is me on the day we opened. My hair color was a different color then. <laughs> the, the stove is a beautiful little beach stove, cream and green, and it, we've got it wired up and it actually works. And my, my research showed me that cream and green was the very first color scheme ever for a kitchen. Before that, there just wasn't even thought of color schemes. And I was able to do um, an entire cream and green kitchen and it was uh, a lot of fun. So, so I have to thank um, Ben for you asking us to do this because it's brought back so many memories in it. It really has shown how far we have come. So, so thank you for the memories. Oh, great. And thank you for sharing them with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you want Jack to talk about uh, mustard now or how you'd like to do that. Okay. I, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want us to take uh, too much time here, Sarah. So let's see whether I can edit this right down here. So then if you could head for the younger picture there of uh, John Mustard. She first met John Mustard in the fall of 1890 when she went up for what she thought was going to be enjoying a joyous reunion with her father in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, the, uh, the new wife. Unfortunately, it was uh, not the most uh, wonderful lady to live with there. Anyway, somewhere there is the picture of John. We'll take a peek at it later. He was 22, she was 16. And very soon she discovered he was planning excuses to come for dinner at their house. And the family had this- I, I don't know if this helps. Here we are. This is the young John Mustard. Okay, anyway. So the one night he said to me, Is, do you think anything can come of this? You know, our conversations and she cut him down pretty quickly. And as you've read the diary recently, she says I was a minx, I made him a laughing stock. So that ended that. There he is. 
So yeah, here he is, and uh, she really did her best to, to downgrade this portrait. But I'm looking at a guy who is confident, um, knows what he's about. I find him on the, uh, something to look at. I'm, I'm going to ask you to take a peek at the one down below that in a second here. So yeah. we leap forward here. She has just married you. They've come to Ontario to a place called Leesville. Horror of horrors. She discovers this is John Mustard's hometown. And she meets, uh, first of all, she says in her diary, if you look at October, she says he understands he's now a minister and looking after a small mission church somewhere in Ontario. We actually met at Christmas and um, she did her best really to uh, picture as somebody who was maybe three levels above the village idiot. And this is how it went. Obviously though, they started to discuss things because during the war, World War I, she learned that his son Gordon was overseas. When Gordon came back in 1918, he was looking for peace somewhere and he thought of Muskoka, he rented a canoe. He found a spot that was just north of Bala and jumping quickly ahead here, they bought the piece of property for $100 in the year 1920. Uh, John and his son built what they called a Muskoka shack, which was looking out of what we call the North Channel there with two islands that seemed to dance in the sun, one called Miramachi, and yet the became Miramachi is the one that concerns us. So in 1922, she was looking for a place to go for a holiday. She left it too late, I won't go into the reason why, to go to PEI. She was very curious to see the cottage. So we are totally convinced from everything we've read, John Mustard was the reason they came to Bala. They arrived on Monday, July the 24th, right after breakfast, which by the way was at Fanny Pike's place. They got in the car and they drove slightly north and over a bumpy road getting to it, they came to the cottage. Here is what she said about it. They have a cottage on the ideal spot on the bank of Lake Muskoka, buried in maple and oak trees. I loved it. That's quite something coming from Mark. The sure is. hot, noisy world was far away. Cool stillness was my companion. The gods of the wild would welcome back their home. And so they spent the whole day there and in the afternoon she sat on the porch gazing out at uh, Miramachi Island. Unfortunately, uh, must have thought it was his duty to be, stick with her, that irritated her. But that resulted in a daydream which she had the following day or so in which she populated the island. And this became Barney's Island. The seed had been sown. And uh, so I would like to very quickly take a look at what she said. In 1911, she said he was at a small mission church. Linda and I, in preparation for writing a book about Lucy Maud Montgomery and Bala, met a granddaughter who was the family historian. And so we know that five years before they came to Leafdale, he had become the minister at Dufferin Street Church. The, con the congregation Christian. was almost invisible at that time. He turned it into one of the biggest congregations in West Toronto within that five years. And thanks to fundraising, he built a beautiful church which remained a landmark for some time. No small mission church there. 
1928, he had approached the 60s and in his years, he looked about to retire. And then he heard that another church called Oakwood was just about to vanish because of dwindling people there. And he shocked everyone by quitting and at a vastly reduced salary going there. My gosh, he did the same miracle. Within a few years, he brought the attendance right up. And that today is still a landmark in all that area. 1937, he finally retired. The congregation was so grateful. They gave him a new car and gave his wife a sewing a machine. Sewing machine. <laughs> and uh, he didn't get away from the church because in 1942, the same year Maud died, he was appointed the moderator of the Anglican of the Presbyterian. Presbyterian Church, all the way from Toronto to Kingston. And a couple of years after that, his alma mater, Knox College, honored him for a full day. They gave him an honorary doctorate. And he died within four years after that, but at his funeral, they looked back at his life and they called him a saint. So the last two or three sentences I'm going to say about this. Could you pull up or you've got the picture of him on the rock? Yeah. Yeah. Mary Rubin and I, and I have discussed this many times and we've agreed. There's no way she could miss the contrast all during the two weeks, all the pictures we have, Ewan is seen in the same black suit, almost ready to deliver a funeral service. She looked at John Mustard. The man she turned down. There he is, tanned, absolutely suited to the rhythms around him. He got up early in the morning to catch fish for breakfast. He carried in water for washing and drinking and the whole thing. And he went to sleep at night listening to loons and whippoorwills. There was no contrast between the two. Mary had said to me more than once, she must have thought she married the wrong man. I'm going to hold right there. That's quite the perspective. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing all of that. That's a, that's a lot to absorb. <laughs> But he was a pretty incredible man. I remember reading about him in the journals. So that's a great, that's a great story. Um, I do want to get to some of the questions that have come in through the chat. Um, I want to go back to Kathy Wazalenki. Um, one of the questions that came through early on in the chat is about what the artifacts are that are housed at Leeskel. Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Um, we have uh, very few artifacts as such because much of the furniture was moved to Norville and um, the rest was auctioned off it would seem. So we have uh, a large uh, grouping of uh, pictures of the interior of the home and so we have tried to match the furniture with antiques and so on that we have uh, found over the years. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, the committee has done a, a pretty good job of that throughout. And, um, you know, the church itself, of course, has it, the original plaques, two plaques to uh, the fallen soldiers that um, she dedicated uh, Rainbow Valley to. Um, we have the original pew, the chairs uh, that were used in Ewan's time. Um, we have signed books that came from her um, library that was in the um, parlor of her, or sorry, the library of her home. Um, she had over a thousand books in her personal library. So we have managed to collect uh, many of those and uh, continue to. 
And uh, so I think we have a few articles of clothing uh, from Maud as well. I but, can... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. This is Melanie. Um, I just want to add to that, that we do have a blanket chest that was donated by Kate McDonald Butler that belonged to um, her grandmother. Um, it came in quite a state of disrepair, but we have um, men on our, in our group that did a good job of restoring it. And we have the nurse's outfit and we have the doctor's bag that belonged to um, the doctor who, Dr. Bascom who attended Maud um, during birth of Stuart. But Kathy is correct in saying that we do not have very many personal um, effects from, from Montgomery. We enjoy the ones we do. And we have people in the community that have donated um, valuable additions to our restoration of the manse that come from the time period and the families that lived with at the time there that Montgomery lived. But um, that is about the length and breadth of it. Thanks. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so thank you for that, that detail. We also had another question that's for um, both you, Kathy, and Kathy Gassel, which is what are Leakesdale and Norville like today? Um, are they still their own unique towns or have they been sort of absorbed into the larger Toronto area? Um, can the two of you each speak about your locations? respectively. Would you like me to start, Kathy? Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Leesdale is very much still a small village. Um, there is one new subdivision, uh, I would say of approximately 30 homes. Other than that, um, it's a very slow growing rural village. Um, and so we have we we find that um, it's very much as Maud and Ewan would have found it. The roads are a lot better, uh, but uh, other than that, we have the beautiful uh, side road, and uh, the township has not uh, paved it so that we could keep it intact for. Um, the experience of people driving down it towards the site of the one room schoolhouse where the boys went. And uh, you can still see uh, around the church, the farm fields and so on that uh, she experienced when she walked down to the store or whatever. So uh, it has not grown significantly in the past number of years. Kathy Gasson. Yeah. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> the village of Norville is actually nestled in the valley of the Credit River and the west branch of the Credit River. We are in a green belt. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have Upper Canada College uh, Nature Reserve, which is about 500 acres. So when you're in the little hamlet, once you leave all the busy roads that have been built around us, um, there is tranquility. Um, however, we have lost our flour mill and um, many other heritage buildings, including the, the school, our post office, all of these buildings, the residents fought to save, but unfortunately progress is um, on our doorstep. But yes, as, as I speak right now, uh, the road that you and spoke to uh, or that the McDonald family drove to um, Union Church is still much very rural, but I believe in the future that will change. And uh, we still have the Russell's Hill of Farm, um, Russell's Hill of Pines, and the house and barn. But all of those uh, will be destined to um, development. They, of course, are up on the hills. So you come. You, there are four roads leading into the village and um, the roads above are becoming busier and busier. But the setting of the manse and church and the caretaker's cottage and the Credit River, that site is intact as it was when Maud was here. 
I, I wanted to mention too that uh, Leesdale still has the least home um, across from the manse. It is still very much as it was with the barn. And um, we have to the south of Leesdale, the cemetery where baby Hugh is buried and the gravestone there. So there are lots of little spots along uh, the way to um, see some of the history and uh, happenings that Maud and Ewan would have seen. In Uxbridge itself, we have the original train station um, with a tourist train that runs um, from uh, least, uh, sorry, from Uxbridge to Stouffville now, but uh, she arrived by train there and came up by horse and buggy. She did a lot of shopping in Uxbridge. The main street of Uxbridge uh, still has some of the historic buildings and so on, uh, but it is starting to expand and grow. A quick follow-up question to Kathy and Kathy though. Are Leesdale and Norville still in existence as municipalities or have they been absorbed legally by surrounding, surrounding areas? Uh, Leesdale was originally part of Scott Township. Mm -hmm. And that's what it probably would have been in her time. Um, so Scott uh, was north of Oxbridge Township. Then uh, Oxbridge took over Scott Township, and so um, Leesdale became uh, a, a little village in um, the township of Uxbridge, but um, it's still very much a part of its original community and an extension of um, Uxbridge in that most people, because there's not a, a lot of stores in uh, Leesdale, um, most people shop in Oxbridge and so on. So um, there hasn't been much of a change other than in name only. So. And uh, Norville, Ben, it was never incorporated. However, uh, the local mi municipality has recognized the significance of the Still many, many heritage homes exist here. So we are designated as a hamlet area and embedded in those planning documents are um, unique planning policies specifically for our village. So the hope is that um, the buildings that we've lost in the past, we won't experience that in the future. And of course we have our organization, our charity has designated the manse and the caretaker's cottage, which was built in 1840 on that, on the site. Okay. So a, relate, a, a related question that's in the chat is, is the manse being turned into a museum about Maud or is it historically, sure. is it, it, it's historic preservation, but is it also being turned into a museum? I think is the question. Yes, that's yeah. our goal. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear about that when we go into the next questions, I guess, or I can say it now. It's, yeah, so we're, the manse, yeah, absolutely. So, go ahead. Yeah. So our vision is to um, definitely create a museum in the Lucy Ma Montgomery's home in Norval. Um, right now we have it rented out um, because we have finished all of our planning approvals. It's right now zoned as a residence and we need to rezone it into um, an institutional site. Is that, how difficult is that? Is that a big challenge to overcome or is that, that something that's likely to go smoothly or you don't know? <laughs> um, well, COVID has kind of prevented us from moving forward, but um, it's, it's not only complicated, but it's very expensive. So on our site, we have to have an official plan amendment, a site plan and a rezoning. And along with those um, planning items, we have to have studies. And because 
We're in the jurisdiction of a conservation authority. We need to have studies for that, a traffic study, and the list goes on. So it is extremely um, time consuming and complicated. And I know the other Kathy will know exactly of what I speak as a former politician. Um, so that is going to be a big frustrating point for us in the future. Hmm. But I can say that um, we're still happy that we have preserved the house and um, the church property. Mm -hmm. Not the church itself, but the church is on the property. So we're happy that we were able to do that. That's wonderful. Um, we're coming up on the hour. Ben, I want to just check in and see if there are other questions that are out there that should be answered. I want to make sure that we've covered things that people wanted to cover. Um, let me see. I think I think people have been a lot of people have been saying wonderful things about all three sites. Um, and Bala is the next place associated with with Ma that I want to visit. That's from Gabrielle. Um, she, Gabrielle also said, I visited Leafsdale in June, 2019, and it was wonderful, which of course it is. Um, Allison has said, you've all done a brilliant job. I was in Leafsdale last week and the buildings are amazing. So yeah, so the, lots of great, uh, great comments from, uh, from people in the chat. Okay. I want to um, check back in with our, our panelists and see, is there anything more that you wanted to tell us that you haven't had an opportunity to tell us at this point? We've tried to get to everyone and I don't wanna miss any, anything that you've prepared that you wanted to share with us today. So then after that, we can sort of open it up to a broader conversation. Um, I, I would like to say a few things. Um, just about, you know, how we've coped with uh, COVID and how uh, the site has come through uh, this whole past two years. Um, the uh, new president, not new president, she's certainly not new anymore. Uh, she was my vice president, but uh, Melanie and the committee have done a wonderful job managing to get through the COVID. We have, uh, because we are an independent national site uh, with no help from the township or any others, um, it's, it's often hard for us, but we have managed to make it through. We've had our usual teas. Um, so I, uh, I'd just like to list a few of the activities we have for those that may not know all of what we do to keep the site going and encourage you to um, come by if you have not been by before or to come back and see um, the improvements we've made. And so I'd just like to list some of the things we do. We do tours and children's activities. Um, we have workshops. Every year we have a Lucy Maud Montgomery Day. We have our own play, which just celebrated 10 years. It's a one woman play. We do it every summer and by request at other sites. Uh, we've done other plays. We've done Emily and Anne. We've had art shows. Um, we now have tea and scones for your visit. We always do a garden tour uh, throughout the community, and we always do a Christmas concert for the community. And we love partnering. And this year we partnered with Pickering Museum for the Maud and Anne experience. We um, are partnering with the Book Drunkard Celebration um, with some children's activities coming up shortly. Um, we now have a new Lucy Maud Montgomery self-guided trail um, and the Leesdale Mance National Site was nominated last year um, in the Star Readers 
uh, Choice Awards, and we were runner up to all of the large museums in Toronto, the Aga Khan, the Batashu, the Gardner Hockey Hall of Fame. We were actually runner up second place to the favorite museum. Um, and so that's, that's just wonderful for us. And uh, so I, I just thought I'd brag a little bit and, and um, tell you, uh, you know, some of the things we do. And so check out our website. And uh, if you haven't been for a while, think about coming back. There's always something new and exciting going on. Thank you. I, I, w I wish I lived closer. <laughs> I'd like Sorry. to add something else. Also. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, it was actually uh, in 1991 when the University of Guelph professors, Dr. Mary Rubio and Elizabeth Waterston were doing their field work and visited Norville. And this early meeting actually resulted in my momentum to um, earnestly recognize Lucy Maud Montgomery and Norville. So even though we um, didn't acquire the manse until 2017, um, the community has been very active in promoting Montgomery since the early 1990s. So we've hosted Montgomery Christmas, speaker series, festivals, tours, children and garden programs. Uh, we have a garden dedicated to Lucy Mall Montgomery since 1992, and those gardens were expanded in 2016, and we added uh, the children's garden of the census. Um, and fortunately, the two buildings that Union and Presbyterian Church sold to us in 2017, we have turned the 1840s caretaker's cottage into a little mini museum. So when visitors do come, we have an opportunity not only to walk the site and walk some of Maud's favorite places around the village, um, we have access to that building. And pre-COVID, the Presbyterian Church let us showcase their beautiful Gothic style church. So we also um, um, still invite uh, tourists to our community. Thank you. Sarah Houghton is Yes. Jack, mm. Wonder by any chance whether you're, you're talking about things we're proud of. I don't know whether you can see me here. I'm holding I can see up you. some sheet music. I can't see that. You need to hold it more toward Linda. <laughs> How's this? There we go. Good. Excellent. Several years ago, probably 12 or 15, we spotted that on eBay. And we were amazed. We thought there's a piece of music called Anne of Green Gables. We discovered it was written for the first Anne of Green Gables movie, which was not Megan Follows, not the one in 1935. It was 1919, a silent movie. And we bid on it, not realizing. <laughs> We were bidding against the National Library of Canada. So, wow. as a, so as a result, it went for just under $1,000 American money. That was the winter we ate a lot of macaroni. We ate a lot of macaroni. <laughs> after that. Anyway, we went down to where we understood it was filmed, which was just south of Boston, a place called Dedham. And the building that they used is the oldest frame house standing on this continent north of Mexico, 1637. So the movie came out in 1919. Whoops, are we there? Yeah. There's, the, movie there's the building. Okay, yep. So, the, those two or three buildings are now a museum. Linda and I went down two years in a row. And the people there knew very little about the movie that had been filmed there. And they asked us to take the tours for two days. And 
It turned out because of a scandal, the movie was withdrawn by Paramount Pictures. Well, less than a year after it went out, every copy has disappeared. They're in a metal can. It, it, it's an officially lost silent yeah. movie. So with the help of some of the people who are actually around the faces this, this I see here, yes. we were able to locate many, many, many of the old stills which appeared. And then thanks to least you know, Kathy. I, I, I was just gonna show, we found a copy of the Mary Minter, Miles, Mary Miles Minter, who was the actress for Anne, um, uh, Anna Green Gables, and it had photographs, movie stills from the movie. So that began our search to see what that movie was like. With first of all, it started out in a very amateurish way as what we call the uh, Magic Lantern Show. And uh, our good friends at least still brought us down and had us show that. And they were very, very encouraging. We have a wonderful family relationship with least still. Uh, Nina Elliott, uh, the president at the time, said this has to go to Prince Edward Island. So. And uh, so we had shown this at one point, and somebody came up to me at the piano. I was playing the silent movie music. Was his name Ben? Yes, he had a funny last name. What was it? I don't know. It's hard to pronounce. Lefebvre, something. <laughs> <laughs> he came up and said, do you realize that the story of the play, the script, is in the Library of Congress down in the U.S.? And I believe, Ben, you sent us a copy of that. Um, and so I, I forgot that I did it, but I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> we are to do. <laughs> so in the year 2008, the University of Prince Edward Island was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the book, 1908-2008. And they had got to a certain point <clears throat> And somebody said, well, why don't we invite Jack and Linda? And everyone said, who? No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> well, anyway, so, Mary, so what we had done, we had gone far, far beyond that magic lantern show we would shown at least still, because we did about 12 years of looking for silent movie stills, some of whom were not recognized as being part of the Anna Green Gables movie. And because I have a really good eye for detail, I was able to say, hey, that's the same background as the picture I saw in that Mary Miles Minter Anna Green Gables book, or that's the same costume. This has to be from the same movie. So we were able to parse this all together and make a very good semblance of what the movie looked like. But it's not good enough just to put pictures up on a screen you have to sort of explain what's happening. So although it was a silent movie, I took the voice parts. So I wrote a script for it and took the voice parts and ran the PowerPoint. And Jack did, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> no, I just wanted to no, ask finish, you. Finish. I just wanted you to say, when Matthew comes up with the buggy, and there is his little scrawny wife beside him. Wife. Yeah. Not wife, wait. I said wait. Yes. <laughs> and out comes Marilla. And what does Marilla say? Matthew Cuthbert, who's that? Where's the boy? <laughs> so that gives you some idea about the background but, we had there. But Jack also did the silent movie piano music. This is that. This is your cue. Get your paper. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. Yes. I have here if this will show. This is the silent movie music that was being played by every silent movie pianist okay, in North America at that time. So we haven't got time to look at that, but if you want grief, it's there. If you want burglary music, it's there. If you want music for Anne weeping in the East Gable bedroom that first night, Jack, Hearts, Jack had it down. Hearts and Flowers. Yes. Jack yes. Benny used to play that on the violin. So 
So we have done this and we are, we are still doing live presentations of this. You know, our museum, unlike um, Norville and Lee Steele, we are a private museum. We haven't had a penny of government money. And it's been very difficult for us during COVID because we couldn't ask for any grant money. We have an aging roof and we've had many people help donate to that. I have a Facebook page for Bala's Museum that we've been selling extra things that we can no longer fit into our museum or have display space for. So this is what is keeping us going. But if someone would like to hire us for a fundraiser for us to do our silent movie, it's it's a real fan teaser. Anyway, there, that was the ad, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, are are DVDs of that presentation still available for sale? Because I I have one from you, but are are there still copies available for it's people? It's out of prints, but there's talk about doing it again. Yeah, it, it's it's very difficult for us to do another one because. Uh, to do a reprint of, of, of that uh, movie because they want us to buy a thousand oh. of it and or, or a hundred some of them and we just can't afford to do that right now and I'm not sure we can sell a hundred so that's it's not something we want to invest in at this moment keeping the roof on our building because we have historic designation now for Ballas Museum is very important because we have that obligation to keep that building uh, as good as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our challenges. Anyway, thank you again, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ben, for. Uh... <laughs> so do we have any other, oh, there's a question in the chat, which is, you know, what, what can we do for the roof? It says, how can we, done for the roof, but I think they're asking yeah. is what, what can be done? So, so see, upper roof needs to be redone. Oh, um, how can we donate? That's what they're asking. Sorry. Okay. This is a typo. <laughs> <laughs> donate. <laughs> I, I, don't, I thought she might get up there with hammer and nails, but anyway. Um, Jane of Lantern Hill style up there with overalls. Yes. Their yes. Feet. <laughs> uh, they can get a hold of us through uh, Bala Museum at muskoka.com. And I imagine Ben might have some of those addresses for people later. Yeah, I typed them into the to the chat for all three mm -hmm. all three sites. Um, yes. And so, yeah, ballasmuseum.com. Yep. Here's the website. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, um, this is Melanie. Um, I'm sorry, I have to leave before you open up. So I just wanted to say this and listening to the three, uh, the people, not three people, but the people talk about their sites. Kathy, you did a good job of bragging on us. Good one. Um, <laughs> I, and, and, you know, everybody, the thing about Norval, Leesdale and Bala is we all have our unique place in the history of Lucy Maud Montgomery and we are all working our hardest and doing our very best to preserve that and to um, carry that story on for generations to come when I see but the one thing I wanted to make clear here is how Ben thank you for doing this in the first place because I think it has pointed out to all those of you on lots of you know us already um, but how wonderful it is that the Ontario sites are a family and we support each other. Um, we, you know, we, we, we go and experience the different places, um, you know, help with funding. Um, yes, we have our own story to tell and we like to brag about our place, but really we work together um, for that most important part uh, to bring Montgomery's story to the world. Um, I think it is remarkable. I think it is a remarkable partnership that we have, and it, it will it will continue for a long time. Um, and I think that's the most important thing that has come out of this today, Ben. And thank you for setting that up. I also want to say that lots of people that are listening today, uh, Mary Beth, I see you there, dead center. It's wonderful to see you. But there are so many people that have supported all these sites for years and years and years since the early 90s or before. And that is certainly appreciated. 
And it was a wonderful idea to do this. And I just wanted to, if you don't mind, express that thought. Thank you. Thanks here, very much, here. Melanie. Thank you. All right, any last questions or comments? We can, if people have, would like to chat. Oh, is, Jack and Linda, is your book available at the museum? <laughs> I think we have about four copies left. That's another thing. Um, unless we can get this book completely scanned, all our printer, the man who printed our book, has not been able to find his original stuff to reprint it again. So um, that's, an, that's another huge expense for us to reprint it, unfortunately. Beth, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, for people out there who haven't visited these places, I, I just want to say that it is all of them, all three of them, um, are a place where you can kind of step into Montgomery's world and get a sense of her own space just by hearing the wind or watching the water or seeing the beautiful uh, trees. You know, go in October to all of these places and, and aren't you glad we have October? Um, yes. All of them, all of them, uh, the people that have done these with so much hard work and heart not only have preserved and uh, maintained and built up these beautiful structures or homes, which we know were really important um, for Maud, that uh, places, not only just the home, but the environment were so important to her, but they've also captured her spirit by including authentic gardens. Uh, and, um, if you look at the Bala Museum and the yard and the fence and the flowers around it and the beautiful river and waterfall and lake, uh, you are in, I mean, you're in Muskoka and you are in the Blue Castle. When you're in Leesdale, they've done the man's gardens. Um, they built a garden by the uh, church with a beautiful uh, uh, sculpture of, of Montgomery. And in Norval, they have a fabulous Garden of the Senses, a wonderful uh, little sculpture of a little girl reading. Um, I'll tell you, you will feel like you've stepped right into Montgomery's books. So uh, not only is, uh, it does, is PEI an authentic experience with the author, but so are these places because wherever Montgomery was, she made that her home and put her heart and soul into each of these places and never left a place without regret for um, the feeling and the environment and the inspiration <clears throat> that she got from each place. That's it. I think that's a wonderful summary. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's great. Um, well, thank you all for being here today. Ben, I'm going to kick it back to you to talk a little bit about um, what's coming up next time. Great. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you very much, Sarah, as moderator for, for leading this discussion. And I want to thank Kathy, Kathy, Linda, and Jack for agreeing to be here today. I'm so glad it worked out for all of you to be here today because it couldn't, we couldn't have done this without all three sites represented we that was something that we as a committee that we were dead set on if we're going to do this at all we need we need all three sites here uh, and in case somebody's wondering where toronto is the toronto home where montgomery lived with her family uh from 1935 until her death in 1942 is still privately owned uh there is a plaque in um in the park mm -hmm. buyer house but the house itself is privately owned which is why uh, the house is not represented here today. So next time we uh, will, and I thank you as well to Beth for um, uh, summarizing the experience of these sites. And because I'm also, and I'm, I'm especially thankful that you did so because I'm happy to let you all know that our next Mon Conversations about Ella Montgomery event will be with Mary Beth Cavert. And it will be on Saturday, November 27th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern time or Eastern, I forget what once, I forget e e EDS or EST or anyway, 2 p.m. <laughs> because 
we're changing it the changes clocks tonight. Tomorrow, but, but <laughs> yeah. anyway, it's still 2 p.m., three, three weeks from now. And Beth will be uh, uh, walking us through uh, her amazing research on Montgomery's correspondence with George Boyd McMillan, oh, her okay. Scottish correspondent. So we're all looking forward to that. that In the meantime, um, I so if you're interested in more events uh, for conversations about Ella Montgomery, please subscribe to um, the blog on my website, which is lmmonline.org, if you haven't already. And that will give you um, emails. The blog post will be emailed to you and that will include uh, future events for the, from this series, as well as future things from, uh, from my own research projects. And so, yeah, so that's about it. So as we always do, we will, uh, uh, people who want to stick around for informal conversation are welcome to do so. But for now, this will be the end of our formal presentation. So thank you all again for joining us today for conversations about Ella Montgomery.